We'll see. Hang on. It's looking good. Things happening. Amber, are we on? We are. Oh, we are because I can't see it. So. Oh, right. yes. Let me go over here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you love live? Oh, there we go. We are live. This is Dr. Robin McKay and welcome to our team meeting. Executive Roundtable for Women Leaves. I am here today with my very special guest is Wendy Williams, who I have known for, oh my God, like I want to say half my life, but it's not quite that long. So I'm kind of <laughs> cool. um, Wendy, I want to just read a little bit about you um, and do an introduction. And then we're going to dive right into our content tonight because it is such an important thing that we're talking about. So hang on just a second here. Okay. So Wendy has taught spiritual growth, personal growth, energy work, energy healing, and manifesting for 15 years. In addition, she has over 25 years of corporate experience in tech, leadership, and consulting. Her master's degree is in counseling psychology, and of course that trained her to diagnose and treat psychological disorders while enhancing human potential. She knows how to bring out the best in people and how to coach them towards greater fulfillment, joy, and self-mastery. And Wendy, you and I met way back in, I think, 2005, maybe 2006, at the University of Kansas. You were getting your master's. I was doing my PhD. And we met in our multicultural awareness class. And I have to tell you, you changed how I think about all of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. Social injustice, racism, what it means to be an African-American person in America today. And I just want to thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. It was 2005. We had several classes together. That's right. That We did have several classes together. What do you remember about that time in terms of the multicultural awareness part of the training? <laughs> Uh, I remember it was a single class <laughs> for one, which uh, well, I, I suppose for the master's degree might have been enough, but I think it deserved more attention. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that stood out the most to me is the cultural attitude between um, um, a BIPOC, um, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, perspective on mental health versus the white perspective on mental health. Um, and it was a very different approach to um, a therapeutic relationship. And, mm -hmm. and that's what stood out to me the most. Most people of color prefer really direct to the point feedback mm -hmm. very quickly and clear, specific guidance. And um, there's a much more roundabout passive approach that seems more palatable for people that are not um, of color. Well, yeah, a solution-focused approach versus a psychoanalytic approach really is kind of how that differentiates. But for sure, and mental health is such a big piece of the puzzle, even for what's going on today. And I'm so glad that you're here with us. This is my Executive Women Roundtable community, of course, and these are women leaders who are in tech, in healthcare, they're coaches and consultants, some of them, but for the, the vast majority of them are actually working in the corporate space. And, you know, I think the thing we wanna talk about tonight is getting your perspective on racism, on you know, all the things that's go that are going on in our world today, all the conversations, the, the conversations about Black Lives Matter, about George Floyd, and about so many other issues around racism that just continue to come up and 
be revealed today, every single day. It seems like something new is coming out. So I'm going to let you dive in. And I know you've been doing this training for, you said the last three weeks, you've been doing a lot of education and training. And so I would love for you to just dive in and wherever you want to get started in terms of what you've been seeing, you've been boots on the ground with this. So what, what are the things that we need to talk about today in here? Yeah. So, um, well, let's start from a scientific perspective. Um, uh, having bias is biological with a lot of neuroscience to back it up. So it allows um, humans to make very quick decisions, right? So our bias is built up of our life experiences, um, information we absorb from the culture and our family environment, our friends, and all the different groups we belong to and the ways that we move through the world. Um, and it's biological and everyone has bias. <laughs> so it's not the exclusive domain of white people. It is a human physiological, neurological process that is consistent for all human beings. So there's nothing wrong with having bias. It's how we function. So Everything just to start there. I think it's a really important thing. I was actually thinking about that earlier today when we look at sociology, we see and social psychology, we see in groups and out groups and in hunter gatherer days, that was really important. You could look very quickly using biases and heuristics or rules of thumb to determine, is this a friend or is this something that's gonna eat me or kill me? And that was kind of the um, the decision-making process that early man would go through. And of course that still happens today. Absolutely, and it's necessary, it's required with the amount of decisions we make every day, minute by minute. It's that's how we- You bring up biases. Um, about a month or so ago, one of my one of my clients asked me if I could please tell them the difference between biases and intuition. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's like a master's level, dis you know, a, a dissertation topic or a dissertation question. So there is, guys, a, a longer video training on the difference between intuition and bias as well. In Big difference. <laughs> yeah, well, that's an important uh, thing to uh, to differentiate. For and, sure. Uh, to, yeah, to parse. Wow. So um, everybody has bias. It's human. And we also, from an uh, evolutionary perspective, have developed the neocortex. Yay! So instead of being just ruled by the what's created by the amygdala and our brainstem, the lizard brain, and all of that stuff, and having knee-jerk reactions and running our bias mechanisms unconsciously, humans have developed the neocortex, which allows us metacognition. I can think about what I think. <laughs> I can have a judgment and an opinion about my own beliefs, about my own thoughts, about my own reactions. I have this capacity to observe those things and make executive decisions. Yay us. So, I think it is part of improving humanity to consciously choose to not operate from unconscious conditioning and pause to, to do self-assessment and develop self-awareness and make conscious personal choices. And that's required to shift from operating in a reactionary mode where everything's automatic based on biases versus making a conscious choice of the type of person or leader you choose to be based on your values and your beliefs. And that requires something that is a gift that we all received from the pandemic. It requires a pause from busyness. Yes. And it also requires the will to be able to, the will to want 
to look inward and to examine those unconscious biases that we possess because there are some people for whom those biases are pretty advantageous. In fact, one of the things I've seen recently, for a while the narrative was we have to fix, the, the system is broken and we have to fix it. We have to dismantle this broken system and we have to create a new system that's now somehow, that's somehow better, that's improved. But recently I've seen a new narrative, which is that the system isn't broken. It's actually like it's a game that's been rigged for some people. What are it's your worked. thoughts on that? Yeah, the system is working exactly as intended. Yep. And it's, you know, <laughs> there are, it's like there's a group of people who have the hacks and know all the shortcuts and know all the, have all the things that you need, the gamers who know how to win the game. And then there's the rest of us who are trying to figure it out or having to actually play a different game or take more steps or take a longer time to accomplish something within a system that's not set up for success to begin with. Yeah. You know, I'm going to say the bottom line of all of my leadership training is empowerment. And empowerment requires you to observe how you've been participating in life in a way that's programmed versus your personal choice based on what you choose to believe and what you feel is right for you personally. That requires developing also um, some ego maturity, having a backbone, being willing to stand for something, have, mm -hmm. developing courage, um, being willing to take risks and, and observing what's happening in the world from a place of humility mm. and, and really being able to say, there's a lot happening that I just don't understand and I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then sitting in that position of humility, admitting I don't know and choosing to ignore, be silent, or to learn and grow. So let's talk about institutional racism, shall we? And by the way, guys, I've just gone over, I clicked over to the Facebook page and we've got some live listeners, live watchers, and so happy to have you guys here. It looks like Pat Gillum is here, Janelle, Mary, Angie is here. So good to see you guys. And if you have any specific questions, for us, for Wendy, for me, um, just go ahead and write those in the comments. And Wendy, I'll keep an eye on that. And I would love for you to talk and just share, just really educate us about institutional racism and what is that even? Yeah. So I think it's really important for my white siblings to know race in America is about money and power. Most people do not discuss it that way but that is what it's about. I am in the United States because me and my people, my ancestors were a workforce for wealth. The civil war was fought over money. The entire economy of the South was run and built off of slave labor. That is the bottom line. So, so slavery is about money. And we all know that in our capitalistic society, money is power. And keeping people from having access to money keeps people from having access to power. So the states that wanted to secede from the Union, <laughs> the state, the, the South, um, had a really powerful vested interest in maintaining slavery. And they were very, very angry when slavery was abolished. And they immediately jumped into what is commonly referred to as Jim Crow laws. Um, but they actually wrote in not only Jim Crow laws, which are local regulations, um, ways of doing things, but they also implemented actual laws to restrict 
the power of the African American population. They were really resentful of their workforce taking their power back. Very resentful. So um, one of the stories that most people, most Americans of any hue don't know about is immediately after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, there, it was kind of the Wild West. There were a bunch of laws that weren't on the books to handle the change in society. And 90% of the African-American population signed up to vote. 90%. And they started electing African-American members to state congressional roles. And they, the U.S. started seeing all of these former slaves and African people being elected to public service positions. This was before um, laws were in place to prevent that, that kind of thing from happening. Well, the response from white America was mass murder and assassination and um, cheating so badly with voting that certain um, candidates would win by over 100%. That's how bad the cheating was. So um, it, it, it's, a his, it's part of American history that isn't shared and it's not discussed, but there were, I think it was 60% in certain areas of the US of the elected officials that were African that were assassinated, 60% within months of being elected, assassinated. Um, there were black communities where 1500 Africans, Americans were wiped out in a matter of a couple days to prevent them from voting again. Mm -hmm. So when we say racism is systemic, it is really systemic. It is not um, casual. It is quite deliberate and it has been calculated to keep African-Americans from power. Now that plays into um, wealth as well. I mean, there's story after story after story where African American communities develop strong economies, and then those communities were bombed, burned to the ground, looted, and um, land taken away, just like what was done with the Native Americans. That happened over and over and over again. So Google Rosewood and Google. Um, uh, the Black Wall Street and um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. So that'll give you some stories um, about these occurrences when African Americans would build their own economies and gain some affluence and wealth, and that just simply wasn't tolerated by white America. So I think it's really important to understand that a lot of the ways of operating like um, redlining. Are you familiar with redlining? Oh, the gerrymandering, is that where they, or is that- Not with the voting. So redlining happened, this is, um, this is um, an illustration of very real systemic racism. Redlining is where um, banks and mortgage companies would redline or circle areas in, in a city where they refuse to allow African-Americans to get loans for homes, to keep them out of certain neighborhoods and to keep them not only from having their own personal homes, but to keep them from commercial wealth. So it didn't even matter if you had good credit or enough money, you were, if you were African-American and you went to get a real estate loan for real estate, you were, kept out of those areas. This is still in place in the United States. Um, I had a friend that told me, and this is within the last five years, that they're um, in, I think it was Wenatchee, Washington. They still had maps 
where the areas were redlined still. So again, this isn't like what was happening 400 years ago. This is happening now and has been happening throughout the history of African Americans being in the United States. So the part of yeah. it is the um, so Brene Brown just I just posted this on my on my page. I just saw this from Brene today. She said, um, "Daring leaders don't remain silent on talking about hard things." Basically, yeah. And by remaining silent about things like this, whether we know about it or not, like this is new information to me. So now I can't unknow that. Exactly. And so now when I, since I can't unknow it, now I have, I'm in choice about, do I talk about this or do I ignore it? And that's where, when you talk about the, you know, being able to think about your thinking, there's some stuff like this is taking the red pill, right? If you go to the matrix and like, once you know, <laughs> you can't, you don't get to unknow it. Yes. Does that makes sense why I say so this is really important just in terms of the conversation, you know, in our own homes and in, in culture around why we're having all this conversation about racism and systemic racism and even what is that? So exactly. by participating in the culture, we're participating in systems and structures that have put, been put into place to um, disenfranchise, to consciously disenfranchise an entire community of human beings to keep them from power to keep them from power and to keep them specifically from money and it's layer after layer after layer of institutionalized ways of interacting with certain populations okay so you start with redlining which means for centuries African Americans have um, been restricted severely from accumulating generational wealth and being able to pass down property through their families or to secure commercial property and homes in really nice areas. Okay. So, so that means if an African American would like to own a home, they are going to be restricted to lower quality neighborhoods with lower home values. In addition to that, we have the system of um, how education is paid for in the United States, usually through mortgage taxes. So if you are an African-American and you're living in a primarily African-American neighborhood and the home values are lower, so the taxes are lower, there's less money for schools, then your children are receiving a lower quality of education and opportunity than children of your white counterparts, right? So it's layer after layer after layer of systemic mm -hmm. discrimination that builds in making um, success in the US um, exponentially more difficult for the African-American person. Pat Gillum is on, she's watching our are live today and she writes dr robin this is a great conversation this country is built on racism and discrimination against women and african americans and yeah i was thinking that too and i want to get to that in just a second because i want to talk wendy with you about distance from privilege because we can't the other term that we've been hearing a lot lately is around white privilege and what is that and you have that and you know you can't say that you don't have that so i want to have that conversation but before we do it Angie Pettit is in ATX, Austin, Texas, and she says, how does money and power drive the sy systemic level of hatred? Yeah, it's really interesting because um, politicians have always used creating um, division and fighting to control large populations. If you, if you can keep people from unifying, you can keep them from becoming powerful. And politicians and big business understand that they have to keep the masses divided in order to maintain control. 
because if you think of it as a you know person to person balance of power the public has the power right there are more of us than leaders of of multi uh, national um, conglomerates and corporations and there's more of us of the mass consumers than uh, politicians so how do you keep the masses millions of people under control well you make sure that you foster hate and division instead of unity, right? Yep. What happens with unions? All of a sudden, the masses of workers have power because they have unified. So hate is used to keep people from joining together and, and having power. It's, 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 um, it's, you know, controlling masses 101. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you for that, answering that. Let's shift gears and talk about privilege. And I wanna just introduce this topic by saying that Barb and I wrote about um, privilege in our book, uh, Smart Girls in the 21st Century, that got published in 2014. And she and Barb and a couple of her psychology colleagues created actually an assessment of distance from privilege. And this is not something that we typically hear about. Most of the time we just hear about white privilege, but when we look at just the core of who is the most privileged group in the culture in America, we're looking at white, male, um, heterosexual, or cis, cisgender. Cisgender. I'm not, that's a new word for me because I'm behind on my continuing education. So cisgender or heterosexual. Yeah. Um, Christian. Yes. Affluent, educated, able-bodied. What else, did I miss anything? I think that covers the the biggest areas. <laughs> Usually from a, a large metropolitan area, so close to centers of power. And the further away one perceives herself or himself to be from that center of privilege, the less power, the less influence they actually have access to in terms of career, money, power, all the things that we've been talking about. So definitely race is the piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole thing. So can you talk about privilege from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. Um, most privilege is really, really, really unconscious. That's why we have people running around saying, hey, we had a black president, isn't racism over? Uh, no, <laughs> it's, it's not. And it's not, um, the closer you are to that pinnacle yeah. of privilege, the less likely you are. And, um, Hold on, I just screwed something no. up. I just screwed something up. It's, it's not. And it's not, um, the closer you are to that pinnacle of privilege, the less likely you All right. <laughs> oh no, what did I do? Are we We're live? still... We're still live. It I'm looks really like. sorry. I just I messed something up. I'm so sorry. Okay, so go ahead. I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> I, think I think it's Mercury retrograde. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm going to chalk it up to my ADD. Let's forget <laughs> astrological. We'll just to my brain. Sorry about that. <laughs> so Sharice also said, um, close to the center of privilege is good looking. So. Oh that's yes. That's another. That's enough. Being attractive and being tall. Oh, yes. As well. In the name yeah. John, I think. There were more, <laughs> <laughs> more John men named John CEOs in all of the CEOs than there were in entire women, like any woman. There were more men named John. So I think that was what it was. It is really common. That's really interesting. So I apologize, Wendy, for my total distraction. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. So um, if you are American at any level of the socioeconomic scale, you are highly privileged. I think one of the things that's so shocking to people that never leave the United States, or if they do leave the United States, they go to Canada or somewhere in Europe, is that the world is primarily not white. Like white people are a very small majority, small minority of people 
on the planet. And when I think that's a little shocking for white people to absorb and digest, because um, if you're American or European and you live in a first world nation, you live in a bubble mm -hmm. separate from what's going on in the rest of the planet. And you can believe that this is what you are living is the universe. It's the way things are. And it actually is not. And I think it's it's been really frightening for the, the people in first world countries that are in positions of power now are seeing the populations shift even in the first world nations. So pretty in our lifetime, there will be more um, BIPOC, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color in the United States than white people. Okay, so the percentage is going to shift in our lifetimes. The people that have power now are very, very, very aware of that. And they're very scared of that. And the reason why they're scared is they, because they believe that when the people of color come into power, that they're going to do to them what they've done to us. Yeah. Which is not the case. It won't, it won't work that way. But you cannot convince the people that have power right now that that's actually the truth. So you wanted me to talk about privilege. Um, I like to, to bridge understanding and make it really easy for people to digest. Um, if you're American, including me being African-American, you have tremendous, tremendous privilege. So you are more affluent than about 80% of the population on the planet. If you have a refrigerator, if you have a bed, if you have a bathroom in your home, anywhere in your home, if you have running water, you are more privileged than 80% of the population on the planet. That's a bit of a wake up call, like splash some water on your face. We are all privileged who are born into first nations economically. So we all have privilege. Um, and one thing I tell people is my name is Wendy Williams. Like every high school had a cheerleader with that name, <laughs> you know, grow, growing up there. Okay. <laughs> it's a super white name. And I was rising through the ranks in corporate America before social media, which meant on paper, on a resume, because my name was not Shaquanda, I looked white. I was educated, highly experienced, and my name was white. That got me into the door. I got interviews that my counterparts, my peers, African, my other African-American peers, I got into doors they would not get into because I was presumed to be white until a person met me face to face. Even with a phone screen, mm -hmm. people could not tell that I was African-American. I remember I worked when I was in my mid twenties, I was working at a large conglomerate with 10 subsidiaries all over the country. And I was on the phone with the people in the subsidiaries daily. And one of those people came to the corporate headquarters, met me, was completely shocked that I was black and called up human resources and told them that they felt deceived by me because they had no idea that I was black after interacting with me for years over the phone. Huh. <laughs> Which I laughed about quite a bit when I heard yeah. that. I thought, oh, sorry, I didn't have my boom box on my shoulder so you could identify me as black. It was really crazy. But talk about, um, talk about unconscious biases and assumptions. Yeah. And then exactly. that somebody would feel fooled or <laughs> deceived <laughs> because they were just immersed in their own biases. So it's not, you know, they're so somehow a victim of your being African American. Like how, like that's how screwed up the system is, in other words. That's exactly. I didn't fit a stereotype. And so somehow I had done something underhanded. Yeah. 
yeah, very interesting. Uh, and I, uh, so, so I know what privilege is because I have a lot of privilege. You know, I am American. I can go almost anywhere on the planet and someone is going to speak English. Mm-hmm. And I have, <laughs> I, I could function in Kiev for goodness sakes, mm-hmm. because I'm accommodated mm-hmm. as an American. Mm-hmm. Um, that's privilege. Uh, it's that I don't think we're actually accommodated as Americans is in Paris with the waiters. The <laughs> waiters don't really like, I, I could usually do like bonjour and parlez-vous anglais s'il vous plaît. And then they would kind of like acknowledge that maybe they could speak English and they lie when they say that they don't. <laughs> so that, like, Am I you, right? Like the so Italians, you, on the other hand, they're, you know. So you and I are having a very privileged conversation right now about our time in Paris and Italy. Yes. Let's <laughs> okay. If you wanted the definition of privilege, it would be this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a great experience with Par- Parisian waiters, probably because they assumed I was from one of their colonies. Oh, yes. Martinique or something like that. Some African nation. They, 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 you know, the French were all over Nigeria. I'm not Nigeria. They were many African nations. So I always got treated well, actually. Good. Well, I had some privilege. Because you have more privilege than the Amer- the white girl from America. <laughs> yeah, from Parisian waiters. Yeah. Um, can we, Janelle asked a question that I wanted to bring to the fore. She says, and this is, guys, listen, this is such a good place to ask questions. Wendy, can you just talk about what your philosophy is on helping white people understand? So, yes. Please. I mean, right now, the, the world was rocked, just rocked from the trauma of watching a murder. That it was traumatizing, which is, I think, one of the reasons why we have a worldwide movement is because people were traumatized by watching a murder, the murder of George Floyd. <clears throat> um, Black people in particular are tired emotionally right now and on edge. Um, we're hyper conscious of fearing for our lives, especially African American men, um, but African Americans in general. And um, there's a lot of confrontation, there's a lot of um, grief. You know, I spent weeks just crying and crying and crying and crying over all of this. Um, and a lot of your black friends do not have the capacity to have conversations with you right now. Um, because of my training and because of my personality, I tend to be a really safe place to have difficult conversations, um, a, a safe person to have those conversations with. So I welcome any questions that you have from my white siblings. If you have a question, um, you will not be criticized for asking a question in this conversation. Um, so I, I believe in creating a safe place so people can learn. I'm passionate about teaching people. So somewhere in here, her comment just disappeared. Janelle, can you copy and can you text me? Because I don't see how, unless, can you see it, um, Wendy, on the comments in the Facebook group? It just totally disappeared on me. Let me um, let me check for you. I'm going to pop over here too and see. OK. Oh, maybe I can get it here on my phone. Sorry, guys. Thanks for thanks for your patience. OK, Janelle says can you help me understand something that has always baffled me since I was a child? My father came from Europe as a teen and was taught racism and bias against blacks and women. 
However, he had a boss at the Department of Justice that he respected and quoted often. When I met her, she was a Black woman. That level of disconnection seems so incredibly prevalent. How do we approach this dangerous undercurrent? Oh, that's a great question, Janelle. So it reminds me of uh, Spike Lee's movie, uh, Do the Right Thing, mm -hmm. where um, John Tuturo's character, I believe it's John Tuturo, uh, is racist and uses the N-word and everything else. And then he is singing the praises of Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when his, one of his coworkers says, wait a minute, Michael Jordan's black. What, you know, why, why do you love him so much, but then you call the rest of the Black people the, you know, the N-word? And the guy says, well, what? Michael Jordan's not Black. He's not one of those. So there's this, there's a, um, <laughs> when it comes to socioeconomic status, celebrities are on a higher rung of the ladder and a category of their own um, that allows people to bypass um, stereotypes of groups. Mm -hmm. That is actually really, really common. Can we talk more about bypassing? Because one of the things that I've been talking about is there is a especially not with individuals necessarily, but the conversation is, and I remember this, let me, let me back up a second. I'm going to go back. We're going to do time travel back to the university of Kansas, 2005 multicultural awareness. And Barb and I were teaching this class two white women teaching this class. There's a very, a pretty diverse group of people. There were international students, African-American students. And then there was this little group of, we called them the Amy's who would sit in the back of the classroom. They were white, they were privileged and they would sit back there and say, I don't understand why we have to keep talking about this stuff. I've never experienced X, Y, and Z. And um, you had something important to say there around why it's important to keep talking about it, which impacted me. But um, one of the things that there's this desire for is can we stop talking about this already? Can we, like, when is this going to be over? And it, there's this desire to bypass this really important conversation. It's a difficult conversation and it's important. And one of the, so bypassing, so spiritually bypassing, I'm just going to own my way out of this. I'm just going to pray my way out of this. Light, light and um, love. <laughs> light and love. Just, I'm sending you love. I'm thinking of you. You're in my thoughts and prayers. Um, <laughs> And guys, there's nothing wrong with meditating and praying. And you know me, I'm like, that's my go-to. And we also have to be able to have these difficult conversations and do this introspective work in order for something different to come forward besides the institutional and systemic racism that we are living in. So let me give you the point, having said that. Why, is it, why can't we love and light our way through this? <laughs> well, nothing will change for one. That's, you know, the bottom line. Um, that's, that's a way of just ignoring what is uncomfortable and difficult. And the truth is, um, if you are at all interested in being the best version of yourself, you must be committed to growth. And growth requires discomfort. Mm -hmm. You cannot elevate yourself and your understanding and your wisdom and uh, the way that you operate and your alignment with your own purpose or values, um, unless you are willing to grow and mature and increase your wisdom. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, the analogy is um, building a fit body. You cannot avoid exercise and if you are improving the shape of your body you will experience discomfort and pain in the process of building something really beautiful right so i love um uh robin sharma's quote 
and he's the guy who wrote um, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, I think yeah. is the name of his book. Yeah. And Robin Sharma says, all change is hard at the beginning, messy in the middle, and beautiful in the end. Mm -hmm. And that's true for everything in life. When you start, it's hard. You're fighting against inertia. It takes the most of the work. Typically, to radically change anything in society, um, a movement or a revolution is required. Revolution involves anger. Revolution involves resistance, fighting for something, speaking out against things, having a voice, pushing for change. There's a lot of discomfort. And let's be real, American society and our culture is built on greater and greater and greater levels of comfort. <laughs> so we're going against the entire momentum of purpose and drive as capitalistic Americans to move towards greater and greater and greater ease and comfort. We're saying, it's time for HACs, excuse my French, those hard ass conversations. That's what's necessary for change and growth to change things. Are you really okay with African-Americans being um, approved for business loans at a rate of 29% when Hispanics are approved at a rate of 49%? and white people are approved at a rate of 76% for business loans. That's yeah. statistical fact. Is that okay with you? Now, what happens to a lot of people is, okay, I understand that now that I've heard some of these stories that it really is built into the system, that it really truly is institutionalized like their entire industries built to keep parts of the population out. So what can I do as an individual? And anytime we're confronted with um, something that requires social change, that we look at it and say, yep, that's not right. But what can I do, little old me? Yeah. Right, yeah. that's the first place that people go to. I've been there when it comes to voting and climate change and, and those types of things, the, the problem feels so big and we first approach it by feeling powerless. Why do we feel powerless? That is also institutionalized <laughs> because we are programmed to feel powerless because the people in power don't want us to be feel powerful. The other thing, as I'm, you're talking about this, I'm thinking about white racial identity development and about how the early, early stages of that, there are several, but the early stages are basically, I'm not aware of my privilege at all. And the next stage is basically white guilt. Right. My, in the women that I speak with have that, and men too, but you know, since my community is primarily women, say, I don't, some of them say, I don't want to feel guilty because I'm white. And there's this misunderstanding that you either are unconscious or you're guilty. <laughs> well, I don't even think people understand guilt and what actually it is. I love Brene's Brown, Brene Brown's um, definition of the difference between shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. Guilt is actually really healthy. Guilt mm -hmm. says I've done something wrong. So a behavior of mine or a choice of mine was incorrect. And I feel bad about the impact of that and I'm willing to change. Mm -hmm. So guilt is actually a really healthy place um, as compared to shame when you say, I am a bad person. So when a person says, I don't wanna be guilty because I'm white, they're shaming themselves. They're mm -hmm. saying, I am white, therefore there's something bad here. And that's the profound sense of powerlessness. So the shame and the powerlessness are the... Now, this is the other thing about American society. We're excessively narcissistic and obsessed with ourselves. Oh, come on, Wendy. 
Oh my God. I mean, the era of the selfie, if that isn't proof of how narcissistic our society is, I don't know what else. It's pretty much really out there. So people have have forgotten the fine art of empathy. And they've gotten lost without spirituality in whatever way you choose to define it and participate in it. The bottom line of spirituality is about being connected to something greater than just yourself, including all of your, your human siblings. So we're all cousins to whatever degree, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, the guilt is being narcissistic. Oh, poor me. Now being who I am is wrong somehow. When instead of focusing on yourself, first away, step away from shame. You're nothing's wrong with you because you're white. We are talking about systemic racism. We're talking about behaviors and biases, which are not who you are. They're things you have that can be changed. They're mutable. So they're, they're not who you are, they're behaviors, they're right. thoughts, you, right? So be conscious of, and that you can make a conscious decision to do something different. Exactly. So step away from this kind of erroneous uh, relationship with the word guilt. It's, it's being used in a, in a shameful way. So that's step number one. And then step number two is learning that any one individual can have a powerful impact, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the choice. When you decide that you want to contribute something positive, <clears throat> any single person can have a huge impact. So the first step for people, what I call the, the kind white majority, if you, if you consider yourself a nice white person that's not racist, listen up. The first thing you can do is choose not to be narcissistic. So stop thinking about yourself. <laughs> Step, step away and look and say, why are people talking this way? What is the reason behind people saying I'm privileged because of the color of my skin? Why is that? Like, really, why are they saying that? Because I don't get it. So step into curiosity step into listening and choose to be empathetic and and ask and be okay getting a no because black people are exhausted but find a safe place there are safe places to have these conversations and if you really want to know how you can make a change on an individual level find those places choose to educate yourself read books lots of resources, take courses. There's workshops being offered all over the place and or find someone to talk to and educate yourself. Understand the cause and the reason and the root for um, the talk track about white privilege. Seek no. to understand. It's so good that you're bringing this forward because to your point about asking questions and doing a deep seated inquiry, you know, this George Floyd's murder and all of the other, I use that as an example, but there's so many other things that are happening right now. So just what's happening in our culture right now really brought to the forefront, Jesus, Robin, you're a psychologist who has a deep level of training in multicultural awareness and cultural competencies and all those things and those are always playing in the background of my life and in my profession and i was really feeling called to bring this forward but i'm going to raise my hand and say i had this sense of well who am i i'm a you know here i am a white person talking about this but you said something to me that you know really you do this for me wendy you just always are influencing me some whether you know it or not but to your point about african-american people being 
exhausted and they don't you know the conversation that i'm listening to in social media is we don't want to answer your questions stop asking us to explain why you're privileged stop it and so part of my work with my private you know my private sessions with my clients is to really dive into that from my perspective as somebody who's trained and you know done a lot of my own soul searching around privilege and power and racism um, in my professional and personal development so this is you know the executive roundtable is a safe place to have these conversations wendy is a safe person to have these conversations i'm a safe person to have the conversations and to ask the questions as well and i'm also going to tell it like it is like when i hear people when i hear white people talking about you know this reverse racism that's not a thing people it's not <laughs> it's not a thing oh uh, it's, it's so again if if a person honestly if you are listening to this and you have felt yeah this is some reverse racism happening right now then i'm going to give you the same suggestion that i just made take a moment and stop thinking about yourself and think why are people sounding angry and aggressive towards white people like, do I really understand where that's coming from? And if you watch the beginning of this conversation that I've been having with Robin, and you hear and understand that in African American history, when we have attempted to rise, build our own economies, build our own affluence, it has been repeatedly stolen. And we've been repeatedly mass more murdered generation after generation after generation, then you start to have an understanding of why there's so much anger. Um, and, and one thing I do want to say just about Robin and I being safe places, uh, safe people to, to talk to, we are both trained in psychology. We are therapists. We, we are counselors. It's where our heart is. And we are leaders. So leaders step up and take responsibility. Leaders are where the buck stops. We have backbones. We have some ego strength. We're tough enough to handle whatever pops up with them. They were trained to do that. And we have a calling to do that. That is why we are safe places to have those kinds of conversations with when your neighbor or your coworker may not be that person. Right. You know, it's such a good point that processing the emotions around and the trauma and the grief and all the things um, takes a special kind of personality and a special kind of training to do that most people aren't capable of. So to your point, Wendy, thank you so much. So we are at about an hour right now, and I think it's time to kind of, I know, <laughs> this we can talk forever. Like I'm thinking yeah. we should do the Wendy and Robin show or something. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's so much to cover here. Because and I do actually I say that and I mean it because there is I want to get into mindfulness and talking about, you know, you come from a Buddhist perspective, I come from a Christian perspective with, you know, influences of all the world religions, of course. Um, we, what we share is a deep connectedness, a mysticism with our creator. And when we talk about like the spiritual underpinnings of, of, of the trauma and the grief and all the emotions that we experience as humans, as we go through this ascension process, because that's the only thing I can call it is ascension because I, I'm not going down into the pit. Um, I think that it's a worthy conversation to have about the spirituality of this process as well. Would you be willing to come back and do another? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Your uh, program with me. Awesome. Yeah. And um, guys, uh, Wendy, how can they find you? I know you're a member of this group, so I suppose that they can like, they can friend, do a friend request for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm in the group and under Wendy C. Williams. So you can send me a friend request to my uh, personal Facebook profile, or you can find me under, uh, I believe it's Wendy C. Williams coach or coaching. 
is my business page on Facebook. Those are two great places to start. If you friend me, even if you don't friend me and you just find my profile, I have a lot of public posts on these topics. Okay. So um, you can start your education there with some resources. And then the last thing I'll ask for you guys, you know, I always do this is in the comments, I want you to leave your number one takeaway that you're that you learned or an aha moment that you had from this this session today and i think also one action you're going to take what are you going to do differently in terms of your own um understanding of what's going on with um, institutional and systemic racism and i will yeah i just to add a final note yeah, the yeah. suggestion that i made at the very end about stepping back and choosing you know you can self-soothe on, on your own time, but make space to not think about yourself and try to understand what's happening with another person, even when they're being really angry and difficult and they're displaying emotions that are hard for you to handle. That skill will serve you in all areas of your life. It will transform relationships, especially romantic relationships, any um, family relationships, and your relationships at work as well. So being being able to um, become a masterful listener and step into a place of curiosity from humility and really truly doing this, the classic Stephen Covey stance, which is uh, seek to understand before you are understood, just developing that skill alone will completely transform your life and your relationships and put you in a position of power because you are connecting instead of resisting. And so it's a worthwhile um, skill to start um, developing. What a beautiful way to end our time together. Wendy, thank you so much for joining us. The conversation is to be continued and let us know what you want more of, what you're more, what you're curious about, and your number one takeaway from this time together. Big love, everybody, and I will see you guys next time. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye.